So the workshop here is Jen Lumbrus, University of Arizona, and she's going to tell us about efforts in building astronomical instruments for detecting exoplanets with ground-based telescopes in citizen science. Um, hi, thank you for um, being here, and um, hopefully you'll be awake through my talk. I know it's the last talk of the day, and it's been a lot of content today, so thanks for being here. So I'm going to talk to you. Oh, no, it's okay. I'll, hopefully I'll wake you guys up. <laughs> um, but um, So I'm going to talk to you about work I've been doing here in my PhD program. Uh, it's been in astronomical instrumentation, and what we're primarily focusing on is looking for exoplanets. And uh, I'm going to tell you about some work I've been doing for ground-based telescopes and with um, citizen science. So, first off, exoplanet, that's probably the strangest word you saw in there. An exoplanet is just a short, um, shortened word for extrasolar planet, which means planet outside of our solar system. And the first exoplanet, surprisingly enough, showed up in 1995. That's the first detection. Technically, there was a detection sometime in 1989 through radio, but um, it, that wasn't even confirmed until 2001. So, um, exoplanets, we're just, there's many types of planets. There's like the... Jupiter-type planet, there's Neptune-like, there's some super-Earths, which is like just slightly larger Earths, and then terrestrial Earths, so like planets. Um, ever since 1995, um, 25 years later, you can see that like we've pretty much just exploded out of nowhere <laughs> in um, finding exoplanets. We have so far 4,104 confirmed exoplanets this date. There's uh, 4,900 candidates, which means we're not confirmed yet they're exoplanets. And that 3,000... And 47 is saying that they're in um, how many star systems they, that they're in. Also, by the way, like, exoplanets are totally cool because it won a Nobel Prize last year, half of it. So um, the, the name of the game we're really doing is we're looking for an exo-Earth, which is an Earth-like planet. And these are the suggestions we have for looking for an Earth-like planet. The first one is that it must be in a, something called a habitable zone. Sometimes you'll see it in media listed as the Goldilocks zone because it can't be too far out, depending on the temperature of your star. And we picked this zone because this is a region where wa um, liquid water is likely to form so life can happen. The other requirement is that the planet must be about one to two times the diameter of Earth. It cannot be more than two because at that point, the planet will be so big that like, the atmospheric density um, is just too hard to work with. Um, there's two planets um, that have been showed up in the past five years at this point. Um, the first one you probably heard in the news is Proxima Centauri b. Um, that one is in the Alpha Centauri um, system, That one's, which is about like four light years away from here. And that's actually our closest star. Um, the other one you probably heard of was the Trappist system in 2017. They found seven planets orbiting one star. And within those seven planets, they saw that there is about three of them, the EFG here, that are in the habitable zone. Um, so there's many ways to look for exoplanets, and I'm only going to talk about two today. These are the two that we use for our projects. Um, they're, they're split into two different type of detection methods. The, um, they get their name because direct method means you're actually looking at the planet. Indirect gets its name because you aren't looking at the planet, but you're looking at something else to get information saying that, oh, there is a planet um, present. Um, so for an indirect method with transit photometry, that one you can just look at seeing the dip in the intensity of the light as the planet um, transits in front of it. And this is what uh, the TESS space telescope that was launched recently, I think 2018, and um, what, we're, what we are using for um, a project that I do with citizen science called Panoptis. This is also how a TRAPPIST um, system was found. Um, the other one, direct method, this is actually what I do for my PhD. We do something called high contrast imaging. And um, in order to do it, um, especially from the ground, we need to do um, adaptive optics and chronography. So I'm going to talk to you all about um, how that works. So start off, let's look at some ground-based telescopes. Here are a very short list of telescopes um, pertaining to the Western Hemisphere. There's more in the Eastern Hemisphere, too. But these are some telescopes listed. Um, I do want to point out that every single one of these telescopes um, on this image have an adaptive optic system on it because it's really important. Um, the problem with doing ground-based astronomy is that we have an atmosphere, and the atmosphere creates turbulence. Um, Michael Hart gave a talk earlier this week on adaptive optics and what makes turbulence. Um, the point I want to get across with turbulence is that what happens is um, there are air pockets, and then they change their index of refraction. And when that happens, the light rays just move away all, all over the place. So you can see that when you 
when it gets all the way to the telescope and it goes past the primary mirror, it's just a mess. And this is the type of um, image you get from this. And that's actually really hard um, to, to work with. Um, you can't really get any good data. Every time you, if you convolve that image, um, the turbulent um, PSF, then you will just get a very blurry image. You can't really do much science with that. And what we really want is that airy ring one. We like rings. Um, so there's also a relationship between um, telescope diameters and atmosphere. Um, the reason we care about doing um, large telescopes is because of its light gathering capabilities. Um, we do, uh, when you look at the area of the telescope, that is um, called a collecting area, um, it, that scales at a scale of d squared, or d being your diameter. And when you have a bigger telescope, you can see fainter sources. Um, the other really important thing about larger telescopes is that you have a spatial resolution. This is your separation of um, being able to um, see different um, sources together. So. Um, I have a little exercise for you guys. Um, if you, just to understand the capacity of why large telescopes are important, um, here, there's a, you can do this together. So if you do this um, right in front of you, put your arm in front. Um, this section to here is roughly about 10 degrees. So, so whatever you see right there up in the sky, assuming that there's, it's not cloudy tonight, <laughs> is you will see about 10 degrees separation. This is um, an image taken at um, the Magellan Telescope. This is um, Larry Close. He is um, one of the professors in the, the Magellan um, X project I'm in. And this was um, the astronomy um, photo of the day in 2015. And he is actually looking at the Alpha Centauri system um, at, through the eyepiece of the Magellan Telescope. The Magellan Telescope is 6.5 meter diameter. And it was able to fully resolve the four arc second separation of these two stars. Now, these are new units. Um, so um, remember I said earlier, this is 10 degrees. Well, I have a conversion there. About one degree is defined as 60 arc minutes. And that's also equivalent to, to saying 3,600 arc seconds. That's four arc seconds that this telescope was able to resolve. So that's like saying you put your hand up there, and you have to split it like 90 times in order to actually see that separation. The other thing is um, the problem is, well, besides turbulence just being a plain problem, this is just a visual on why. Um, we call something the freed coherence length as the diffraction limited diameter when you have turbulence present. This means that like, um, if you have a very turbulent system, this is the only part that like, this is how big your telescope really is seeing. And you want your money back. That's a lot of money you spend on a really big telescope. So the takeaway point is when you have large telescopes, you need to be able to maintain them if you want them to actually be a big telescope. So let's talk a little bit on how to do that. And that's with adaptive optics. I got this video from Gemini Observatory. So here's some light coming in through the atmosphere. It's going to the primary mirror right now. There it is. Very faintly. Can we turn off the light a little bit? Is there a switch? <laughs> um, four. Okay. So now, okay, now the light went through the telescope. Now it's switching to the um, instrument itself. So now we're going to go to um, an adaptive optics um, system. This is very cartoony and it's um, very, very um, simplified. So this is really what you see when you're at a telescope. Just the instrument is already closed off in the computer. So light's coming in, it's uh, going to the system. So that first thing it hit is um, really important, that's our deformable mirror. That split in the light is so that we can put the red light towards the science source. Here's the light coming in with all that turbulence, so you see it's really messy, that it's not a really good PSF to work with. So now you're gonna see um, something we call wave fronts coming in. They look like potato chips, I'm really hungry. Um, <laughs> So you can see it coming in, and they're splitting at um, this beam splitter. So this blue path right here is actually our corrective system. Um, it's going into an unseen um, wavefront sensor and um, a correction. And this is where we do adaptive optics. That's your deformable mirror. It's telling it what to correct. And now it's um, pushing in the correction. It's going to go through nice and flat. We like flat wavefronts. And there, we're going to have nice PSF. We love that. Um, so that's only half of the problem for looking for exoplanets. Um, AO is the first problem. 
Second half is we need to do something called chronography. Um, to give you an insight of why, it's because um, looking for um, a planet next to a host star, it's actually extremely faint. Um, the analogy of saying it is like saying you are, um, there's this big lighthouse, um, it's, it's like a, it's bright, and then there's a little tiny firefly next to it. Now, your job is to resolve, the di to resolve both of them. You want to see both of them. However, your extra problem is this um, lighthouse is in Los Angeles and you are in New York City. So how can you be able to see that? So um, the problem is you can't because um, the, the um, lighthouse is going to be too bright. So we do something called chronography to uh, work with that. So I got this video from JPL. And so we have an optical system. It's already been correction place. So we have something called a chronograph mask. What is this? We're putting this at the focal plane, so at like the on-star light coming in. We have something called a Leo stop, where um, it's actually reducing the light from the on-star light coming in. You can see that the planet light, when it goes through, it doesn't even hit the chronograph mask. So it doesn't get affected at all. However, when you put all that in, you get this messy image. You have to do some level of correction. So we still use a deformable mirror. You can, the deformable mirror is multi-purpose. And you can work it all the way through until you can start um, creating high contrast. And then you can start seeing the planets. So there is not only one planet, but there's two planets. Yay! <laughs> so um, this is only one of many different um, techniques for chronography. Um, there's, very, there's many different types of chronographs. And they all have very different architectures. This one's called the, the Leo chronograph. So that's like my basic um, intro. So now I'm going to talk to you uh, about when we have a big telescope, we have a big goal, and we want to set the diffraction limit. So I'm going to talk to you about um, MAG-AOX. Uh, it stands for Magellan Adaptive Optics Extreme. Um, this is our instrument um, on the very um, right side. Left. Left. Um, <laughs> on the left side, you can see that's where we're putting the instrument up on the Magellan Telescope in Chile. It's in the Atacama Desert, in the mountaintops. And then this is what our instrument looks like. This is a rendering. I promise you there are posts holding these optics up. <laughs> um, and um, a couple things I want to point out is that we have, we call it extreme adaptive optics because we are pushing the limit of the equipment. We are um, using a really fast, um, we're using a high um, actuator um, deformable mirror. So we have that, we call it a tweeter because that's there to do um, fine corrections. We have a Wolfer tweeter, which is, which is, we have a Wolfer deformable mirror, which is 96 actuator, just for um, really bigger um, spatial resolution corrections. Um, we have a 3.6 kilohertz um, pyramid wavefront sensor. Um, so Michael talked about the Shack Hartman, which was a lenslet array. Um, the, per the perk of using the pyramid wavefront sensor is that you actually get to see the whole entire pupil. With the Shack Hartman, you're only stuck with like that whatever size is your lenslet array. So you create these four pupils. I mean, you're able to see um, what the wavefront looks like. And our chronograph that we're using is something called the vector appetizing faceplate. Um, this is something you put in the pupil plane. So when you see the image, you put, place it on that image. And this is actually the uh, PSF it forms. So these regions right here are the regions of high contrast where we're supposed to, where we're planning to find um, planets. So this is a big job, big project. Um, there are a lot of grad students on it. Um, somebody once commented that there was an army of graduate students working on this project to make it work. Um, my job in this project was to do the end-to-end -end system characterization. Um, this is really where I do a, a lot of signal processing of the data to, to build models. So the type of work I did is um, I got data from all of our reflective um, op optical surfaces. I verified that their metrology was correct using the power spectrum density. The power spectrum density is um, looking at the presence of spatial frequency content. You don't, we wanted to make sure that um, the really fine spatial frequencies didn't have like um, too much of a presence. Um, another thing I did was uh, do static system performance. Um, I did this using something called um, Fresnel propagation. So I inserted every single optic in the system with a surface map, and I propagated from start to finish. And I was able to produce um, these um, PSFs. And what we're looking for is the region of high contrast. So um, this is one right here. That one's like our um, diffraction limited one. 
Um, this one's like the first one if there's no correction. So it already went down by two magnitudes, so it's not great. So I did, then I did another one where I did a basic correction on a uh, deformed mirror, and it worked out. So it went, we increased by one um, magnitude. And another thing I had to do for this project was to analyze how every single component on the optical bench, which you see here, so I tested out every single optic, and I saw how it contributed towards the total um, contrast at the end. We did this to optimize our system. Um, part of being on the Maggie Oaks project meant I was also able to visit um, Los Campanas Observatory in Chile. Um, I went in September 2017 to help um, run the MAGAO, um, MAGAO's uh, adaptive optic system. And this one's insane because like, your deformal mirror is actually on your secondary mirror. And um, so this was the images on um, your left. That was actually my view every single night when I went up to the telescope to, uh, to start my observation run. Um, the bottom of that, that's a Viscacha. It is like a squirrel and a rabbit. Like, it's like, it's a, it's a rabbit with a squirrel's tail. It is the cutest thing. <laughs> um, the middle image is me um, at um, the, the clay telescope after a whole night of observing. Um, top one is what we just opened up for the night, and this is what it looks like. And um, I'm re we're really proud of this image because we had just had an earthquake in Chile, and um, the adaptive optic system did not um, die. It, it just jumped right back in. Another really cool thing that I did was I went to the Giant Magellan Telescope site. Um, it's pretty much right next to um, uh, Las Campanas. You can see it from the location. So um, the image on the left is me. Um, that's me. That's the tiny part. What I circled right there is um, the Magellan Telescope so that you can see the, the view from GMT is in the middle. So you can see the three different um, telescopes that are in Las Campanas. And then the image on the right, that's my view from my hotel, my hotel, we call it the hotel, but it's the dormitory room. So I was able to see the telescopes every single day um, when I was there. Um, a lot of things about instrumentation, it's, it's a lot of work. We do a lot of lo work in the lab. I do a lot of programming, um, but we actually, there's a lot of components involved. You still have to deliver the product. So um, the image on the left, that's um, our, um, that's the computer for Maggie OX. Um, and we have, I forget how many um, Vita cards we are using to run the processing. Um, I spent like a week cutting styrofoam. It was great. <laughs> and um, there's still styrofoam around in the lab sometimes. Um, before we send out the instrument, we have to wrap it up in um, plastic wrap to make sure that like dust doesn't get in. And in order for this to leave the lab, um, we had to hire riggers to move it up onto a cart. So the other cool thing is that some days, as a, a researcher in, um, in instrumentation, you get to wear a hard hat and work with a crane. So this is us at the loading dock at Stewart Observatory. This is, um, the crane is actually, on this um, video, is lifting up the box. Um, I forget how many tons that was, but uh, my favorite part was like actually right here um, in a different video I have. There was like this woman who's like watching and she was like really panicked as we watched like the crane move. So um, there's a lot of things you get to do as part of instrumentation. Um, another cool thing is that we actually had our first light run in December. We've been building this instrument for two years and we finally sent it out. Um, this one image on the left, that's the team who went. I didn't go. But um, I did send um, some chocolate um, to the whole team. And um, I've sent some pictures of uh, the various animals we have in um, LCO. And we actually did manage to close the loop um, with Maggie West on like, the first light. So what I want to point out is these images right here. You're going to see there. Right there is the companion. So we managed to turn on the AO system, look at a bright star with a known companion, and we're able to see it. So that's really cool. Like, we, we succeeded. So. Um, there's a new problem um, after telling you all about this. It's actually really expensive and hard to build an instrument. MAGAOX is NSF funded. It costs somewhere around seven figures. I don't know the exact number, but it broke to the seventh figure. Um, it's really hard to get time on a telescope. MAGAOX only had four nights in Chile in December. That's, a, that's all the time I had on the sky. And we have seven nights reserved in May 2020. So like, for all this work, we're only getting so many nights on the sky. You have to be very considerate of like, what you do. So how can we still find exoplanets when we have limited resources, particularly money? 
So I'm going to talk to you about a project I did. It's called Panoptis. It's a citizen science project. Um, there's Panoptis long acronym. It's Panoptic Astronomical Network Observatories for a Public Transiting Exoplanet Survey. We are building robotic telescopes, low cost, um, so that we can have citizen scientists and anybody interested to, um, who want to look up, who want to find exoplanets. I do want to point out the first P in Panoptis. It's Panoptic. Panoptic means all seeing. And we want people to be able to be able to build these instruments and put it anywhere in the world. So the goal of our project is 50% science. We want to find exoplanets. 50% education. We want people to be involved. So what makes up a, a Panoptis unit? Um, it's this little thing. Um, everything you see here in this image is stuff you can buy. Um, custom, not even custom off the shelf. You just can buy it. Um, nothing custom about it except maybe drilling some holes. Um, takes up only one square meter, which compared to what you saw in um, the mirror lab, that's real tiny. Um, it only costs 6,000 US dollars. That's already magnitudes cheaper than Magnet LX. And um, it doesn't require a lot of power. It's only about one kilowatt hour per day. So here's some sample work of what Panopis is able to do. It's, you have your astrophotography capabilities. But what we do is we um, aim at a target star and we, that we know that has a known um, curve and we're able to take that data. So this one is on the image on the right. That's a, a light curve we managed to produce from one of the test um, targets. So uh, you can see that it actually follows the, the model pattern. Um, we currently have 18 units um, in various build stages around the world. There's three fully operational, and there's three ready to go on sky. Everybody who's in this project is a volunteer, and we range all the way from middle school students to um, high school, university level, professional astronomers, and amateur astronomers. So there is really nothing limiting you from doing this. It's like, you can't say, oh, you're not too old for this. No, you can totally do this. <laughs> We're building one unit here in Arizona. Why did that middle it picture disappear? Oh, there, OK. Um, <laughs> so um, it's me and um, two of my other lab mates. So this is Alex is on top, and then Justin to the bottom. And we've been building the unit together for a couple years. Um, my job was doing electronics, so I did all of the, um, all of the soldering, all of the design. I had to redesign a whole board because I didn't like it. <laughs> and um, Alex does all the software, and Justin did all of the fabrication work. So it was the three of us, we, ev we picked the tasks that we knew we were the best at, but we also worked together and kept um, updates with each other. We also have a forum where we've been updating all of our work, and when we have questions, the team is really good at um, coordinating with us. Um, we spent many nights on the roof of Stewart Observatory running tests. Um, one of the things is when, you, when you, you have to do several tests to make sure everything's working. There was one night, though, at the bottom where the stadium lights were on, so it meant we didn't look there for targets. Um, so we're pretty much on sky ready, but we're looking for a permanent home. So we're, we chose Mount Lemmon Sky Center because they have a big outreach component. And we visited them twice. We, the first time we toured 10 potential locations, that is um, a map of all the locations. We eventually picked a roof of a building. Um, that's us in the, with our Panopolis unit in the middle, um, trying to do some um, hand wavy map. And um, we're currently in the process of writing a proposal so we can formally be allowed to put our unit up on Mount um, Lemon. But in that trip, my favorite part was visiting a sauna that actually is um, in the gymnasium up there. <laughs> um, I didn't get to try it. Um, with it on. We had a very short period of time. Uh, we didn't just do um, doing exoplanet type work with the Panopolis. We also did the Mercury transit that happened this past November. You can see in the images, um, the middle one is a little bit out of focus, but, and the right one is actually better. But this little dot right here is actually Mercury. So you can just see it transiting through. Um, you can also see like all that blurry part. That's because it was kind of cloudy that night, that morning too. So. I did a lot of work with Panoptis here in Arizona. We're almost ready to go. But at the same time, since I was a builder of Panoptis and I knew a lot about Panoptis, I was also invited to go to Bhutan. <laughs> so um, Bhutan, in case geography is really hard at this hour, geography is hard for me every hour, um, is actually in the Himalayas, right between um, China and India. Um, this is what Bhutan looks like. This is the 20 different um, zongs. Those are the districts. Uh, we worked with the school, um, the Royal Academy, and we taught 18 um, students gr ranging from grade nine, grade 9 to 12 on how to build a Panopolis unit. So the really cool thing about Bhutan is that it's also 
flying into one of the world's most dangerous airports. <laughs> um, I was too sleep deprived to notice it was dangerous. <laughs> but um, Bhutan's really beautiful. And coming in, this is actually right here, the, um, the landing strip. And the reason why it's one of the world's most dangerous airports is because this right here is our airplane. This is the view from my hotel. And it has to fly through the canyon through a very narrow strip. Um, there's only roughly like 12 qualified pilots in the world to do this. And so um, when we went to Bhutan, there was a team of about six of us. So three of us came um, together in Hawaii. So I flew out to Hawaii um, on the first day before we left. And we packed everything we could together because you had to bring we had to bring enough equipment for three units because you're getting three units. And then we flew together. Um, so in the middle, the one on the left, that's um, Olivier. He's one of my co-advisors. He's the PI for Panopolis. Um, then there's me. And then Wolfred's on, like, the one who took the selfie. Um, he's a PhD student in um, Macquarie University in Australia who is having Panopolis as part of his PhD project. And if you see in all of our carts, the bottom two baggages, that was our check-in, and those were all Panopolis parts. The top one, we only get one carry-on, and that was all our personal stuff for two weeks. So good thing there's laundry. Um, but we flew for 34 hours. From, we flew from Hilo to Honolulu, then Honolulu to Narita, Japan, then Narita, Japan to Bangkok. Then we switched airlines. <laughs> and then, um, because there's only two airlines that fly into Bhutan, then when we got on the, um, that airline, we had to fly to the border of India. Um, where they had to defuel the plane a little bit so that it was light enough to f um, climb up to uh, the Himalayas up to Bhutan. So, <laughs> I know, I know, it's a lot. <laughs> I was like sleeping for only three hour chunks for the whole trip. <laughs> but uh, when we got to Bhutan, here's all of our equipment. Um, we also brought th um, th four um, viewing telescopes for these students so they have an appreciation for if you doing, working with a robotic telescope, you want to be able to use a visual telescope. We also sourced a lot of equipment locally. Uh, we went to a hardware store in town, and it was one of those tall um, townhouses, and they just had equipment everywhere. The front lady desk knew where every single thing was, and that was really fantastic. Um, so here's um, an example of what our workspace is. Um, the top is our main workspace. Um, I'm right there in the middle working with um, the hardest thing in any um, scientific project, and that is cable management. And, oh, I will like fight somebody who says the cable management's easy. <laughs> but um, this is us at the end of the day. I don't have any pictures of students because they're under 18 and I'm not really allowed to post their photos. But there's a lot of stray dogs in Bhutan. The one right here on the right, that, her name is Moldy. She's my favorite. Um, but in the middle, you can also see that we, um, we also had them, um, we taught them how to use telescopes. And they actually learned how to make their own star parties. It was really fantastic. Within one week, five days actually really, we had a fully built Panopolis unit and we went through um, a, a blessing ceremony um, on, at, the universe, at the school um, so that like, it's ready to go for observing. So in the middle is like, I have some, um, I have some butter tea, it's, it's really salty. And um, I have some, I think it's called saffron rice. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it was really good. It's part of the blessing ceremony to celebrate that we got this unit ready to go. Um, other things we did was since we have three units, we went to site visits and other um, locations for potential um, spots for the unit. Um, one of the places I want to talk to you about is called Chalela Pass. It is, you can see there, it's like 3,900 88 meters. This is equivalent to 13,084 feet elevation. And to get to the site, we still had to do a 2.5 mile hike. So it was really tiring. But the middle is part of the hike. It was very beautiful. It was fantastic. And um, the one on the right, that's Olivier at one of the sites. So other things we did was like, um, we also gave like school lectures and such, but we also gave a public lecture and we were featured in the media. And also uh, we were, we, ha we went through a radio interview where they asked us questions about what it's like being in instrumentation. So um, those are two, of pro two projects I've done. I've actually done many more projects. I still have a space project that didn't fit this talk. But um, I, what I want to tell you is like what I like the most about instrumentation is the community in instrumentation. I have been able to work with so many people. They're so collaborative. And you get to visit them, too. So I was at JPL for a month. In 2016, I did a collaboration project with, um, at MIT 
So I visited them several times. I went to Goddard. Um, I went to Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore um, in the John Hopkins University. And um, they're the ones who run the Hubble Telescope. I also went to the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. That's uh, the museum where they had, uh, uh, what's that movie, uh, Night at the Museum. So I went there, and I gave a colloquium talk in the astrophysics department. So, um, and they let me in the museum one hour early before it opened, so I got to see all the dinosaur skeletons. Um, <laughs> um, other things, it's like, um, and that was just my professional side. This is the citizen science um, side. I was able to visit the Planetary Society um, in Pasadena um, to give a talk on Panoptis. One of the core members in Panoptis works in Google Boston, so when I had a summer internship in New Hampshire, he invited me to go visit Google um, Boston. And I was able to visit Mount Wilson and the Chara telescopes as to when I was helping out with the Caltech group. Um, so part of the really cool thing I want to tell you about, besides the community, is my research group here in Arizona. Um, we have four advisors. So Jared and Olivier are my, uh, Jared's my main advisor, Olivier's my co-advisor. Um, you're probably noticing here that like in this whole picture, there's no undergraduate students. It's not that you can't do instrumentation in undergrad, it's that they all just graduated. We haven't got a new undergrad student. But that said, I want you to know that there's plenty of um, undergraduate opportunities. And um, what I really want to point out to you is AstroTech is held by UC Berkeley. This is going to be the first year to get a, um, hold it. Um, if you really want to do instrumentation, it's a week-long workshop, fully paid. Um, and the deadline is at the end of this month. So if you're interested in doing instrumentation, I highly suggest for you to apply. The other one is the um, UC Santa Cruz um, Summer School in Adaptive Optics. Um, they have one every single year around near the end of summer. That's a really fantastic workshop to go attend. And that's it. My talk's over. It's been a lot, I know. But here's all the, my sponsors that um, I worked with. So thanks so much. <laughs> And a bonus round, this is the real reason why we do instrumentation. It's because we make sweet logos. <laughs> so um, yeah, these are all logos uh, my lab mates have made. Uh, I want to point out that the bottom left and the bottom right ones were made using a deformable mirror with um, a zygo interferometer to get all these images. <laughs> Thanks, <Tom. sighs>